morning, everybody. Good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. So let me know if you can hear me well. Hi, yes, I can hear you. OK, good. So we are very excited to have our first speaker for this event series from Women in Cybersecurity, Windsor Chapter. And uh, today we have Stephanie. She will join to give us presentation about digital transit and incident response investigation. I let her introduce herself in the first slides, maybe. Or you can start introducing yourself, Stephanie, now. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for joining on a Saturday to listen to me talk, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you all. Um, so yes, I will, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Stephanie Corvez. I am a manager for the risk and forensics practice here at GT. Um, I mainly focus on um, digital forensic investigations, incident response investigations, um, and a couple other things that I'm going to discuss. So the agenda that I have right now is I'll go over a little bit more of an introduction on uh, the differences between digital forensics and cybersecurity is what I've found is that there is um, digital forensics tends to get lumped into cybersecurity. Um, it's kind of like cybersecurity is our current buzzword and and so we kind of get lumped into there, but it's actually uh, very different. Um, and uh, so I wanted to get more into the differences between the two because a lot of people are aware of what uh, what is involved in cybersecurity, you know, incident response and governance and, and all of the other things, but not a lot of people are aware, especially in Canada, um, what digital forensics is, what it entails and, and what you can really do. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the clients that we service here at GT. So it just gives you a little bit more of an idea of the scope of people that that we deal with in our firm. Um, and then I'm going to get into the services, which is really what we do with involving the digital forensics and incident response investigations. And then I'm going to give you two examples of the two different sides of the coin of what we do. So case one is a Matthew Fan case study where we talk about or I'll show in detail about the investigative side, um, which involves the digital forensics and all of the fun stuff that we do on that end. And then I'm going to talk about the incident response side, which is the case study the second case study, and you can kind of see how um, how the how the split, I guess, between the two sides of of the coin, so to speak. And then I'll leave some room for questions. So this is me. Hi, everyone. Um, so as I mentioned, my main focus is digital forensics investigations, incident response. I do also do uh, open source intelligence, online social media investigations, um, and I do also do um, e-discovery. Uh, part of my role at Grant Thornton is that I am the national manager for digital forensics and incident response, so I um, am responsible for cases all across Canada. Uh, and I also do manage and maintain the digital forensics lab that we have at Grant Thornton. So everything that we do follows um, very strict uh, laws and regulations within Canada. Um, that's the part that when I talk about the divide between digital forensics and cybersecurity and the lab has been uh, designed to uh, respond to those um, needs, so to speak. So that's part of my my day job is uh, is doing all of that. So here is kind of a breakdown between the differences between digital forensics and cybersecurity. So they are basically two sides of the same coin and they do interrelate. One of the big misconceptions I want to say with digital forensics is that it is um, an IT related thing. I'm like, yes, it involves technology, but it's really a forensic science. It's not like an IT related field. Um, you know, it would be no difference than, you know, say you have blood splatter analogies, blood splatter, and instead of asking, you know, a forensic expert in blood splatter, you're going to get a hematologist to look at it, right? Like it involves the same medium, but very different um, uh, roles that these that these individuals would have as far as interpreting interpreting and collecting the evidence. 
So for digital forensics, as I, as I said, I am a trained forensic scientist. Uh, technology was my hobby when I was growing up. My goal was to actually be a uh, forensic anthropologist. Unfortunately, <laughs> the role for forensic anthropologists in Canada is even smaller than the role for digital forensics in Canada. Um, so I ended up combining the two where I combined technology with forensic science and uh, and here I am. Uh, so you know, one of the things I want to point out is that you never really know where the path is going to take. Um, anything and everything can lead to a totally different field. Um, you know, when I was in school, uh, the role of digital forensics in the private sector um, never really existed. It still doesn't really in Canada to a certain degree. Um, you know, I've been told in the past, and and it is very true, the, it's very, there's, I, I want to say there's less than, and I think I'm being generous with this number, less than a thousand of us in Canada that perform digital forensics, and that's including public and private sector. Um, you know, you can fit us all in an elevator, and uh, and out of that, there's even fewer that are female, and out of that, there's even fewer that actually hold some kind of leadership role in the field. So it is an underrepresented group. Um, and it is small, so everyone knows each other, and we tend to be very, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, we, we tend to help each other a lot. That's another uh, difference with it. Um, not not that saying that cybersecurity doesn't, but we tend, because we're so small and everyone knows each other, there's, there's a lot of collaboration that's involved. So mainly the big differences here, as you can see, that we're dealing with the same sort of evidence, um, but the goals are ultimately very different. I mean, we're looking to when in the case of digital forensics, we're typically trying to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that somebody performed an activity, typically for the point of litigation. Um, and cybersecurity, we're trying to just identify, you know, what happened and mainly help our client to resolve the situation and get back up and running. So here's some of uh, the breakdown, I guess I want to say, between the two different types of careers that you could go in between digital forensics and cyber. And again, this is public or private. Um, what I find interesting is that it's it's kind of reversed for digital forensics and cybersecurity, um, whereas there's a lot more jobs for digital forensics in the public sector, that being law enforcement, and not as many in the private. And it's the reverse in cybersecurity, where there's a lot of roles in private and not many in public. So that's something to keep in mind, is that you can go for um, a variety of different roles in both the public and the private sector. Um, and as you can see, the roles are um, quite different, but they do tend to overlap. There, there are bits of uh, the investigative process that does overlap with cybersecurity, and I'm going to show that in more detail um, as we go uh, in the presentation. Because a lot of people, I'm sure, a lot of you are saying, "Well, what is the difference? What is what is a digital forensics investigation?" Um, so I'm going to show you. So I do have a slide here that has some additional advice and resources for anyone that is interested in learning more about digital forensics. Um, so I will share these slides with everyone and I'm also available on LinkedIn if you want to reach out and learn more and I can give you, excuse me, a lot more information about what is out there and kind of point you to some other people that are in the field if you want to reach out and talk to them. So. Another question that we have is uh, another thing I want to point out is that we do all of these services in house. Uh, GT is very different from a lot of the larger firms in the fact that we do have individuals within the firm that uh, practice these skills. A lot of these skills are uh, outsourced to by a lot of the larger firms, but we do all of this in house, which is why we get to do a lot of these really interesting and fun cases. Um, and we do because we follow a lot of, of the same uh, protocols and processes as um, protocols and processes as law enforcement. We do get to work alongside with law enforcement in a lot of situations, so it is a really fun place to work, and we do get a lot of really interesting um, and different cases. So, who are some of our clients? Well, literally anyone can be a client. We have people that are in the small, medium-sized businesses you know, large businesses to enterprises, 
I mean, all types of industry, all levels of cybersecurity awareness and sophistication, just really anyone can be uh, a GT client. We do a lot of work for the, the smaller, in our, in our line of work, <clears throat> the small to medium sized businesses tend to be the most vulnerable for both cybersecurity incidences and also the more, um, I want to say typical types of fraud investigations and things like that. They don't have the resources that a lot of the larger enterprises do to perform, um, you know, these investigations. And a, sim a single, um, you know, ransomware event could potentially destroy their entire business. So we are very mindful of that, and we do work hard to um, make sure that 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 part of the market is also being serviced because um, you know it's detrimental. Canada is built on its small, medium-sized businesses, and we want to make sure that they're just as protected as our larger businesses are. So now I'm going to get into the fun stuff, and that is what exactly <clears throat> is it that we do? Well, yes, we do the typical incident, incident response services. This example right here is about ransomware, but obviously we do different types. We have the business email compromises, and we also will do um, not necessarily external threat actor types of incidences, but also internal ones. So involving, you know, incidents with companies, steal, uh, companies individuals stealing IP property, although that kind of tends to crawl over more into the digital forensic side, um, but also incidences of, um, uh, for instance, we have one of our clients is, is also a, a large university and we've helped them uh, prove that students were hacking into their their exam databases and were cheating, like things like that. So that's all part of the incident response services. Um, but it does overlap with a lot of our other uh, investigative services. And I want to add that when we conduct an investigation, we do use all resources that are available to us. Um, within within the firm. So it's not if you come in for an incident response investigation and we discover that there is a need for, um, you know, one of the other avenues that I'm going to discuss, we obviously will bring in that avenue as part of it of the investigation. So we believe in like a holistic um, investigation as opposed to just, you know, it's an incident response and this is how we're going to handle it because we find a lot of times there is uh, overlap and, and need for uh, other areas of involvement that I'm going to mention. And the case studies will show that. They'll show the overlap. So when we do an incident, it's basically we're trying to figure out, you know, what happened, who, hit, who where, why, what, when, and how. Um, that's what we try to find out during the initial incident call. You know, we're involved with the data collection and the review of the evidence. Um, we do work with the ransom negotiations as well. So I do want to add that because Grant Thornton is um, regulated as a money services business, we cannot legally perform the ransom payments um, because of all of the laws in Canada around uh, anti-money laundering and uh, terrorist financing. So we do have a trusted uh, partner that does that for us, um, but we oversee the process with them, but we just can't literally go and pay the Bitcoin. Right, so they so they perform that service for us and we work with them to uh, help the client and then, of course, the remediation as as well and also data mining and notification. So that's really what it is in an incident is we're doing all of this to find out what happened. Um, we want to know what they took because obviously the, the trend now with the threat actors, which has been for a while, is not only do they go in and encrypt all your data, but they're going to steal it as well and hold it hostage to try to force a ransom payment. So part of the investigation is to also find out what they took and whether or not that data is sensitive in nature. Um, because our clients do have uh, reporting federal obligations to report under PIPIDA. Um, so it, it's de and also it could just be incredibly detrimental to their business um, if that data is stolen and you know the client doesn't pay the ransom and that data is leaked to you know on the dark web um, that could be uh, just incredibly you know detrimental to the client and all of their customers. So that's part of what we do in the investigations. We want to figure out what they have, um, and then we want to figure out whether or not it is worthwhile depending on the situation for the uh client to pay the ransom or um 
if we're if or not. Um, it doesn't always happen, which I'm going to talk about in the Lockbit case study. Um, and then the remediation, of course, is to get them back up and running as quickly as possible, making sure that the threat actor isn't in there, that there is no other um, uh, malicious software in there that's going to cause a, a, you know, an additional attack or that the threat actor is not still in there. Um, we do interact with law enforcement on the client's behalf. So that's another thing that we do that sets us apart from the other firms. Um, not a lot of other firms will work with law enforcement um, or provide them with their uh, the details of their investigation. Uh, we believe that it's obviously incredibly important that we cooperate with law enforcement because law enforcement is the ones that are going to go and arrest these people. You know, the clients are not going to pay us to do that, nor do we have the jurisdiction or any powers whatsoever to be able to actually go and take these criminals out. So we believe that, you know, law enforcement is working on the bigger picture and it's part of our role uh, to work with them and help them take these guys out. Uh, so that's why we uh, actively work with law enforcement in pretty much everything that we do, including incident response. And the data mining and notification piece is uh, a little bit combination between e-discovery um, and and uh, and the incident response. Like, again, it's kind of where the overlap is in this, where we take the data if there has been data that has been exposed by the threat actor. And we just see what's in there for the client, who's been exposed, what's been exposed. And we prepare uh, you know, a document for them that they can use with their lawyer to determine you know, who needs to be notified um, and at what level they need to be notified and who needs to pay for credit monitoring and so on and so forth. So we just try to help the client through every step of the process because this can this is incredibly terrifying. I mean, like most of our clients have never been through something like this. Most of them obviously are very small. Um, it's it's an incredibly terrifying and detrimental, like traumatizing experience. So we we make sure through every step of the way that we're there to help and guide them and assist them and take the pressure off and make sure that, um, you know, that that we get through it with them um, as without with as little stress as possible. <laughs> um, I know it's very stressful, but at least, you know, having some kind of having plans in place and making sure that we're there to support them through the entire process. So that's the incident response process. Now I'm going to get into the fun stuff. At least I call it the fun stuff. This is the digital forensics investigations piece. So this is the part where it ties more into the forensic science aspect. Um, so what I'm showing here is just uh, an example of some data from a real case. That's why it's blacked out. Unfortunately, I can't show all of the fun stuff, but this is one that we performed that involved um, a major financial fraud for a very, very large uh, Canadian um, company um, that's involved with the uh, television movie industry. And this individual was basically um, stealing money so what they do is they rent out their properties for film and television and this individual was charging an additional fee to these individuals to the, the the casting directors and whatnot um that she was pocketing instead of actually giving it to the company um it was a well-known secret i guess you could say to everyone in the business except the company um so in this instance uh what happened was this was a fun one they're all fun but this one is is memorable which is why i'm going to talk about it um so the way that the client wanted to perform this obviously they wanted to get they didn't have i guess enough they had complaints but not enough cause so we deal with a lot of whistleblowers and that's where this came from um so they wanted to uh get her phone so it's a corporate phone i want to put out out there that everything we do is legal <laughs> with it so um we can if you have a phone that has been purchased and is paid for by your company your company has the right to collect the data from that phone i want to put that out there same for your computer okay um anything that is owned by a company they have legal right to the content within it um, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily being monitored because I'm pretty sure that um, would not fly with a lot of people. And it is also um, illegal in Canada for companies to monitor your day to day transactions or any of your personal, you know, communications and whatnot on your cell phones. Even if they have the management software on there, they cannot legally 
um, you know, be going through all of your text messages and contents on your phone or in your computer. However, um, including your email and whatnot, email is a little bit different um, because it's stored on the company server and it's monitored by the company. It's their domain. But when it comes to personal uh, use of your cell phone and your computer, obviously they're not sitting there and monitoring it. Um, and if they are, that's incredibly illegal. Um, but in situations like this where we have a complaint and we're being called in to see if there's any merit to that complaint, um, we were actually brought in uh, stealthily. This was a stealth collection um, and we do that quite frequently. We were flown out to Vancouver. We worked with the IT team there. Uh, they can, they uh, came up with a plan where they were going to tell everyone in that office that, you know, uh, there was an incident or an issue with their um, uh, their management software and they needed to collect everyone's phones uh, and that they had to run an update on them. So we were waiting in the GT office in Vancouver. The IT guy went to the office, collected all the phones, brought them to me. I collected the ones that we needed to and then he brought them all back. So and then we started doing the investigation and discovered, you know, obviously that, that she was doing exactly what they said she was doing. We even found the bank account information and all of her passwords for those bank accounts on her cell phone. Um, and obviously she actually ended up confessing to the crime when she was uh, confronted with all of the evidence. Yeah, and in that same one, we actually went in when the office closed too and did a stealth collection of her computer. So yeah, that was a memorable one. We were there till like four in the morning because um, we have to go in, take pictures of everything uh, to you know take the computers apart, collect the data and then put everything back and make it look like we were never there. So yes, very fun. Very fun stuff. So um, the other aspect that we do, and this overlaps a lot with not only the digital forensics investigations, but also the incident response, is the, what we call the online social media investigations or open source intelligence. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen something very similar to this. I think it's a gross exaggeration, but I think it illustrates it for the most part of what we're talking about when we talk about the indexed or the surface web versus the unindexed or the deep and dark web. Um, like there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Most people only see what's on the surface web, which is the stuff that's been indexed. So if you open your computer and you type in, I don't know, anything in your search bar, that's that's what's called the indexed web. What else, what other things that are out there is obviously the deep and the dark web. Um, and the deep web, like obviously they're not indexed. You need to know where you're going to find what you're looking for. Um, and you need a lot of the times special account accesses um, or special database accesses to get this information. I mean, like a lot of this you don't want to have on the indexed web. Like nobody wants their financial records or their medical records or, you know, things like that available on the surface web for anyone to be able to Google. Um, but we do have those legitimate <laughs> legitimate access to um, all of the deep and the dark web resources as well. I mean, obviously the dark web is not quote unquote legitimate, but the deep web we do. Um, it's also part of our, what we call the investigative research team, which does a lot of our cap due diligence, but they also do perform the online and social media investigations for us as part of, the, of either the ransomware um, incident response or other investigations that we're doing. The dark web stuff we handle ourselves because it is obviously very dangerous um, and we have special um, virtual machines and accounts, a lot of sock puppet accounts that we use when we're going online to collect that data um, and also people that are trained to do it because Yes, most of the stuff that you find on the on the dark web is going to be garbage, but there is a lot of really horrible things on there and we don't want to have somebody um, that is not um, mentally prepared for that to be going online and and stumbling across something like that. So it's something that we do take very seriously. Um, many of us are former law enforcement, uh, so we are used to kind of the the what what you expect to find on the dark web. Um, so we do, but we do take into consideration. I mean, obviously we do have um, juniors that want to learn these things, um, but we are very, very cautious about what we expose them to because obviously we don't want to traumatize people. It's horrible. Um, so we we do take it very seriously when we're when we're looking for things on the dark web. 
Um, and the overlap here is, of course, when we're doing our incident response, we're looking for leaked credentials and data as part of our investigation. We want to see, you know, what was already out there, um, you know, pertaining to the client before this attack happened. Sometimes it gives us insight into the vector of intrusion, you know, how they got in in the first place. Um, and it also can tell us whether or not they did have a previous breach and they didn't know. Um, and also as part of making sure that the threat actor, uh, you know, follows their end of the bargain if the ransom has been paid. Um, you know, it is very much uh, like a business transaction for them, for the threat actors. They they view themselves as quote unquote legitimate business owners. So it's not necessarily in their best interest because reputation is everything um, in their field. It's not in their best interest to go against what they say they're going to do. but they're criminals. So, you know, we're always very, very, very cautious of the fact that, you know, they can say that they've securely erased the data. They can provide us logs showing that, but there is nothing really preventing them from keeping a copy of it and then posting it later. So that's part of one of the things that we do to ensure to give peace of mind to the client is, you know, after, you know, a couple of weeks, a month, six months to a year, you know, we're just checking online to make sure that none of that data has been leaked. Another fun thing that we do is called IP trapping and tracing. Again, I want to add that all of this is performed legally. There is a lot of information that computers gather about you um, just from you doing everyday activities online. And what we do is we have built an uh, in-house system that allows us to capture that information. So we do do a lot of undercover work um, in what we do as well, where we're talking to threat actors, not necessarily in an incident response situation that's separate. I'm talking about the, the types of, of online social media investigations and digital forensics. For instance, we do have a lot of clients that come to us that are being trolled online. Um, you know, very slanderous things are being said. Um, and a lot of times we do go undercover and uh, help the client identify who these people are and uh, so that they can be served letters of cease and desist. And uh, and we've built tools that allow us to do that. Again, it is completely legal. Uh, this is an example from a real, a real case that we did where we did just that. Um, what we have here is uh, somebody that was going online that was uh, harassing our um, client and uh, they had actually hired a, a very, very large firm in the US to try to track down who this person was. They didn't get anywhere. They came to us and uh, we were able to go undercover. We were able to uh, use our system to get his uh, IP information. We identified um, that his um, his Rogers modem wasn't actually encrypting uh, the MAC address. So the MAC address being the unique identification of you know, that particular device. It wasn't being encrypted, it was just being obfuscated. And we literally went around uh, war driving in, you know, we found out based on you know Facebook and social media kind of where we thought this person was. We found this person's name. Um, unfortunately, there was like, I think, 10 of them in this city. Um, so we got the addresses of all of these people and we just drove around <laughs> until we found the MAC address of, you know, where this person was. And, uh, and then they were served a cease and desist letter. So that's another one of the fun things that we do. Um, and it, again, it overlaps with the online social media. It overlaps with the digital forensics. Um, and it's just one of the other sneaky things that we can do. And again, it's all uh, it's all legal. So one of the other things that we do is called cryptocurrency forensics. So again, when we're dealing with a lot of the criminals, criminals love cryptocurrency, obviously for many reasons. I mean, it's it's not it's pseudo anonymous. It's not completely anonymous because obviously the blockchain is public. You can see it. And again, as I mentioned before, computers still have a way of tracking every single thing that you do, um, and that information is publicly available. So what we do is we basically have figured out systems in-house that allow us to track uh, cryptocurrency both on a device, like a computer or a phone, 
um, and also on the blockchain. So we're involved with a lot of asset tracing that's in, that's involved with cryptocurrency. We're actually involved with a really big case right now um, that I can't really talk about that's going on involving uh, the theft of a lot of cryptocurrency <laughs> and a lot of very upset people. Um, and we're identifying, you know, what happened to all of this, what happened to all of the um, of the of the the Bitcoin, where did it go? So that's one of the things that we do. We're also going to be getting this individual's devices. So we'll be performing digital forensic analysis on the computer and on the phone um, for exactly the same purpose. You know, who were you, who was he talking to? Where did the money go? Um, and what assets do they have that can be recovered um, from this individual? Are there any questions before I move on into a case study? I'm sure there's probably a few um, questions. No. OK. So I'm going to talk about kind of how all of these pieces come together in a real investigation. So I'm going to talk about Matthew Fan. I can talk about this because it is public. You can go and you can Google this case. It was involved with um, this was where we worked with Toronto Police Services um, in in coordination with Matthew Fan. Matthew Fan was I, well, yeah, was a drug dealer. He was selling fentanyl on the dark web. Uh, what happened was he uh, purchased a firearm on the dark web. What a lot of people don't know is that many of the forums on the dark web have been taken over by law enforcement, either from US law enforcement, Canadian law enforcement, or, you know, Interpol law enforcement. So, you know, a lot of them are undercover um, and they and they've built, you know, their own sock puppets and have been, you know, managing online businesses uh, for exactly this purpose that I'm going to say right now. So he ended up, you know, communicating with a member of, I believe it was Department of Homeland Security um, and purchased a firearm um, and Department of Homeland Security. They alerted the RCMP who alerted Toronto Police Services and they set up a sting to catch this individual picking up his gun from the mailbox, right? So uh, they did, and they went to his house, and upon searching his house, they discovered a lot of fentanyl, a lot of drugs. Um, and so obviously they they uh, did the, the search and the seizure of the premises. And while they were doing it, um, they discovered his cryptocurrency wallet. So this case started many years ago when cryptocurrency was very 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 new um it hadn't even really gotten out into the public at this point um our senior manager Dwayne king um he is the one that actually was the toronto police services officer that seized that cryptocurrency he was the first one to ever do it in canada um, and they had no idea at the time what they were doing, because obviously, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of laws and regulations that we have to follow um, in order to maintain integrity and continuity of the evidence. And this was very, very new, um, but they managed to come to a, uh, you know, a solution of how they were going to do it. And he sees that cryptocurrency. So. Where we come in is. Um, again, as I mentioned uh, previously, is that we do work with law enforcement a lot. Um, what we find is that like the tools and, and the techniques and stuff that we use are obviously very niche. There's not a lot of people that do it. Um, law enforcement may not necessarily have the budget for a lot of the tools and stuff that we do. Some of the tools are proprietary. So a lot of the times what we'll do is we'll work with law enforcement to assist them on investigations. Um, in this case, we were assisting them with the Matthew Fan investigation. They came to us to see, you know, what else can we figure out about this guy that could help them, um, you know, in court. So one of the things that we have here is uh, one of our computer forensic tools that's detailing uh, a list of all of the fun artifacts that we have to work from when we collect a computer. So Windows computer, I mean, any computer really, they track literally everything that you do and the more intuitive windows has been getting the more artifacts there are for us to uh, look and see um, 
you know, what somebody was doing on a computer and prove beyond, you know, a shadow of a doubt that that person is responsible for that activity. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind is that the easier your computer is to use, the more artifacts it's leaving for people like me. So not just, you know, event logs, um, because most of the time those end up being erased anyways, especially in ransomware cases. These are all not event logs. These are all hundreds of different other artifacts that we use to piece together exactly what happened on a computer. So, I mean, I like to say it's it's exactly like crime scene analysis, except that my crime scene tends to be inside of digital devices as opposed to being in a physical room. So this is the computer. What we have, what I'm showing you here is evidence of him um, performing uh, the cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, what we also did is obviously our online and social media investigations. We have tools that we use to collect uh, social media data in a forensically sound manner. So it is in compliance with the evidence laws. It's not literally just, you know, copying and pasting or print screening. A lot of the times you can't do that anyways because these sites are dynamic. Um, but what this will do, as you can see, is it will uh, collect an exact copy of the social media, but it also includes changes. So as you can see on the on the right, is that there's been edits to the post that's been made. And even though you go online, you may only see the most recent edit. When we use our tool, we can see all of the edits. So from here, we were actually able to identify um, additional associates of his, and we were able to do our background due diligence information on them. So we find out all of their, you know, their any businesses owned by them legally. Um, we find their own social media pages. We find their associates and it kind of goes on from there. So always be careful and mindful about what you post online. <laughs> That's another one. Um, and all of this information is publicly available, I want to add. It's not like we're doing anything nefarious to get this. This is all publicly available information that we use to um, piece together what happened in a case and to also identify associates and other individuals that may be of interest. Uh, and then we have a case right now that we're working on where somebody has done uh, IP theft, um, intellectual property theft, and uh, they basically, this individual went um, while he was working for a company, he stole, um, you know, not only the, the this, this company's uh, client, very large client, um, but also stole all the materials that he would need to start his own business. And we were able to find social media posts online uh, of this rival company thanking this individual for all of their hard work and everything that they did. And obviously that's been collected and is added to the case. So be mindful about what you post online. Um, so from the information that we gathered from uh, the social media forensics that we did, uh, this is about the social media online investigation. Like just in this example, this is the indexed web. This wasn't any us even going necessarily deeper yet. Um, we start with the index web and then we go deeper as necessary. Um, we actually found obviously his Facebook page um, and we found a company that we knew about, which was the Cryptocurrency Commission. And then we found another one, which is the one on the bottom, which is the Dynasty Auto Care. And this is one that no one knew about that was registered to him. And then from there, we actually found that he had created a new company, which is the CryptoCommission.life. Um, this person was in jail, by the way, when this happened. So when he was he was arrested, he was in jail, he was bailed out. And while he was out on bail, he was creating another uh, cryptocurrency um, business, quote unquote. And he actually started uh, dealing drugs again. And it was actually his parents that turned him in the second time. Um, but this information, we were already aware that he was starting to do it because we found uh, we found that information right here that he was still starting to do it. So this part right here is actually part of what was presented in court to prove that he was responsible for the sales on the dark market. Uh, and this is one of the tools that we use. It's called CypherTrace. This is what we use to show the Bitcoin transactions from all of these dark market um, uh, marketplaces, dark web marketplaces. And as you can see, you can see the number of this has been shrunk down. If you open it up, it goes all over the place, but it's been shrunk down to summarize. Um, you know, all of these sales came from Agora market. All of these came from Evolution market and they went to these wallets. I realize you can't see my pointer. These all came from the Evolution market and they all went to this address right here. This is the amount that went and then this is where they were seized. 
um, by Toronto Police Services. So these are all his sales to his wallets. They were seized and then they were transferred to this Coinbase account where they have been sitting um, and believe they've been auctioned off now. So after a certain amount of time, Toronto Police and other law enforcement agencies auction off the stuff that they seize. Um, Cryptocurrency is no different. I think they've auctioned off a good portion of this now. Um, but this was presented in court. Um, Cypher Trace did testify as an expert witness in this. They are a certified expert witness now in Canada regarding cryptocurrency. Um, and then this is this is just additional details of what we can see on a computer. As you can see, we can see the public and private keys involving cryptocurrency. We can see all the searches that that were performed. We can see literally every browser that they went to. Um, so this is kind of a good example of how all of the uh, things that we do come together when we when we have this kind of investigation. Are there any questions before I talk about uh, the Lockbit ransomware? Uh, I have one question, like how do you decide what kind of data or activity is suspicious? OK, so that tends on this on the case. A lot of the time it comes down to like we conduct interviews as well. So I want to put in here is when we do an investigation, we're obviously we're speaking to the client. The client's providing us with data before we start the investigation. We're also interviewing other people, like not necessarily people that are involved or have performed this nefarious activity, but people that are aware of the situation. So we get a lot of intelligence before we start actually collecting and looking for things, because you're right, like we need that additional input to know what is relevant and what is not. And, and, and we can't start really looking and piecing things together until we have you know, conducted our interviews and gotten our additional intelligence. Um, some of it does jump out right away. Some of it is like, well, that's obviously not OK. Um, and a good portion of it is also just experience, um, you know, like between I think between all of us that are on the investigations team, there's like between, you know, 50 to 100 years of investigative experience. And we collaborate as a team whenever we're doing these types of investigations. So a good chunk of it is experience, um, but a larger chunk is obviously we're we're making sure that we have the full picture before we go in and actually start looking. Um, when we do the initial calls with the client, we're asking questions about where the digital evidence could be because literally everything we do now tracks data, um, even cars. So there's been an instance where, um, you know, we almost had to go out and, and image a whole bunch of ambulances because even cars, old cars even, um, do contain digital data. So there, there's a lot that happens before we actually get our hands on the devices. Okay. Awesome. That's a good question, though. OK, so now I'm going to kind of show you a little bit about um, the the other side of the coin, the incident response. Um, I picked this one just because it was uh, the most interesting. Most of them tend to go kind of in a very similar fashion, um, but this one stood out a little bit and I'll show you why. So I'm just going to talk briefly about this. This could be its own, whole own separate presentation, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a little bit of uh, give you a little bit of an introduction before I start talking about the actual case itself. So there's really three groups of people that we see involved in this type of activity. This is specifically I'm referring to ransomware in this instance. Um, we have our ransomware as a service affiliates, the cyber criminal groups and the nation state actors. So ransomware as a service affiliates are individuals that purchase um, like a subscription from the cyber criminal groups um, to use their tools to perform their own cyber attacks. OK, so they could be anybody. Um, you know, if you have, depending on the ransomware variant, it can cost you a couple hundred US all the way up to a couple thousand, you know, US to rent their tools for a specific period of time. Um, and they offer you support and and the whole bit, just like if you were purchasing a subscription from a legitimate software. So we see those individuals. They uh, are very they tend their skill set can vary again, depending on the variant. They can be very novice or they can be kind of a little bit more intermediate. They don't tend to be super advanced. Usually if they're really advanced, they end up working for the criminal group but they kind of fall in that novice to intermediate and they're and they're a lot less organized. So as I mentioned before, this 
whole world of ransomware is is conducted as a business, and these groups believe that they are uh, legitimate business owners. Um, and a lot of this relies on reputation. So again, it really depends on the variant as to what you're going to run into. Um, so it's really good that we, this is why we keep an eye on um, the different variants. And we make sure that we have intelligence on them and know exactly what we're dealing with. So we know kind of when we walk into a case, um, we ex have an idea of how we expect it to unfold um, because they all will use the same like each group has a specific MO. Each group will handle, you know, a ransomware negotiation and payment a certain way. Each group will have, you know, a different set of tools, a different set of uh, that they like to use. Each group will do a, a specific set of things. So once we, we keep that intelligence and once we know what the variant is, we have a good idea of how the case is going to go forward. Um, the cyber criminal groups are the group, the large groups themselves that I mentioned. They're the ones that create the software and manage uh, the ransomware as a service and obviously perform their own attacks. And they are structured and operate just like a legitimate business. They have, you know, an accounts payable section. They have people that, you know, run the customer service department. They have CEOs, directors, like you name it. It's structured just like a real business. Um, and they actually view the ransom as payment for their services rendered. Um, so when you deal with the actual group itself, it tends to be very professional, very transaction like, um, and it tends to run pretty smoothly, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, as opposed to dealing with the affiliates. And then you have the nation state actors, and these are the um, the cyber, I want to say the cyber intelligence and cyber hacking groups that are sponsored by countries. Every country has their own. Canada has one. US has one. You know, obviously North Korea, South Korea, every country has one. Um, you know, with the war going on in uh, Russia and Ukraine right now, you've heard, you know, uh, President Biden mentioned that, you know, he's got the cyber teams on alert. When the US says that, they also mean Canada because Canada and the US's cyber teams are very interconnected. So, you know, anytime the US mentions anything regarding the cyber cybersecurity nation state actors, it's obviously going to involve the Canadian team as well. Um, but yeah, so we they tend to be more on the cyber terrorism front rather than the ransomware. They may use ransomware as part of their cyber uh, attack, but it tends to be more based on um, infiltration, intelligence gathering, um, or just pure destruction of uh, that company's resources as opposed to a business transaction. So those are the kind of the, the overview of the people that we see playing this game. These are the ransomware groups and variants that we personally have experienced. Many of them are actually very interconnected. A lot of them are now retired. I'm not going to go into it in detail because there's a lot of information I could tell you about a lot of these groups. But just to give you a heads up, some of them are still out there um, and operating. Um, others like Maze and now Conti. Conti just retired. They've gone, you know, and Dark Side is no more. Like there's a few that have gone down, um, but are going to pop up under a different name that tends to be what happens um this is the but these are the ones that we've personally had experience with so this is just an overview of or a simplified model of the ransomware attack methodology um you know the recon weaponization delivery i'm sure many of you have seen something very similar to this it's a good overview but it's not accurate as far as you know what really happens in a ransomware um, attack um, but it does give a really good high level overview of what you can expect to see it actually is much more like this where you know it's very messy um, but a lot of those same pieces still do fit what what technically happens is we have the vector of intrusion you know that in the threat actor gets in typically either through a phishing attack although that tends to be more related to business email compromise and less to ransomware for ransomware they technically they typically get in through um uh, open rdp that's a big one especially over covid um or brute force guessing passwords um, or they'll they'll exploit vulnerabilities in software, and there's lots of them out there. And unfortunately, not a lot of our small, medium-sized businesses or even larger businesses are able to keep up with the demand of patching because obviously these these zero days come up all the time, or these these security breaches come up all the time. Um, and so the threat actors will either exploit those vulnerabilities or they'll use some kind of brute force to get in. Once they get in, they kind of check out where things are. 
um, get the lay of the land. They're going to download some kind of password um, cracking tool. Typically, it's Mimi Cats. It's almost always Mimi Cats um, that they're going to use to get the passwords of the system because the goal is obviously to take over uh, an administrator account of some kind, either local or domain or both, depending on the network and how everything is set up. Um, and once they have done that, they're going to start moving around and see how far that they get. They want to figure out where all the good data is that they can exfiltrate if that's what this group does. Um, and then they're going to collect that data. They're going to export it and then they're going to launch the ransomware. The ransomware tends to be the last um, piece that's done. So in this investigation, um, so this was Lockbit 2.0. Um, this is typically what the ransomware note will look like um, in here. It did say that they stole the data and that they encrypted it. So what will have happened many times is um, we will have um, the ransom notes say that they stole data or sometimes they don't. So part of our thing that we do is when we go in, we always assume that data has been stolen, whether the note says it or not, because we've had instances where the note doesn't say it and the data has been stolen and we see it through the forensic artifacts, or we've had the reverse where the, the note says that there has been data stolen and there's zero evidence in the forensic data that it has been stolen and the threat actor is unable to confirm or provide proof that the data has been stolen. Um, but we'd like to go in and assume that it always has been. So in this instance, um, one, this is, we collected data from all of these systems. Um, typically, and this happens a lot, like most of the time when we're um, dealing with our clients, as I mentioned, they may not be necessarily the most sophisticated when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, a lot of them, you know, they're just making sure that they can keep the lights on and the power going. So we don't typically expect to get firewall or router logs. Um, and if we do, it's it's like icing on the cake, so to speak. Like as I showed you in the uh, back, there's so many other artifacts that we rely on that if we don't have one bit of data, it's OK because we have other bits of data that we can help hopefully piece together what happened. Um, in this situation, they didn't have their firewall or router logs uh, configured to store historical data. That is very common. Um, and then in typical ransomware fashion, they do delete the event logs and the volume shadow copies so that you can't um, roll back. So one thing I like to add as well, the difference between um, this is where the science versus the IT part comes in. A lot of the artifacts that we use in forensics are not known by IT individuals. Um, and I guess that's a good thing <laughs> um, because threat actors tend to only delete the event logs, um, thinking that that's you know where we're going to go to try to figure out what happened. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, sure. And then you know, like there's like thousands of other artifacts that we use to try to figure that out. Um, but that's kind of the the difference between um, uh, the IT portion versus the forensic portion is that IT they're looking usually the computer is is turned on and you're going in from the front end forensics we're looking from the back end so it's a little different. Um, I have a question for you. Stephanie. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you work with vendors to get specific details uh, at the hardware level for any digital forensics? No, we haven't had to. I mean, it's always it's like if I had to for sure, but I haven't had to do that um, between the collective knowledge of our team. There really isn't isn't uh, isn't much that we've had to do um, to get to the um, like specifics of we haven't had to go to a vendor and I want to tell you as well that even if we did, they're not going to be forthcoming with any of that information, especially with Apple and uh, you know Samsung and things like that. They're not going to tell you how to get into their software. They're not going to tell you any of that. Um, we rely on each other. So if I have questions about changes to you know the apples, because with every apple is the worst. It's one of the hardest ones to deal with. But once you get in, everything unlocks. Um, so what if I have concerns about the newest version of iOS and and what 
the security features are that they've added on. I'm going to go and speak to another mobile forensics expert. Um, I'm not going to go to Apple because they're not going to tell me anything. Um, what I will do, though, is I'll download, obviously, the latest updates um, that they have. And based on my own experience, I'll know <laughs> what they've done um, and what holes that they've patched. Um, but I'm going to then reach out to other mobile forensics experts and say, OK, they patched this hole. How are we getting around that? Um, but typically, there's always a way for us to get around it. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. OK, so. I'm showing a little bit of an artifact here that, and this is the reason why I found that this was interesting, is I've never seen this before. I've been involved with over 600 incident response cases personally. Um, I do, like I said, I do work with our national cybersecurity teams, um, and I did give them this data as well to look at. They've never seen this before either. Um, <laughs> what it is, is the threat actor actually searching on the victim's computer how to use their, their malicious tools. So they're using like install Nmap. So Nmap is like a port scanning tool that's commonly used. They use it to figure out, you know, what devices are connected so that they can start hopping around. Um, you know, how is like how to download Nmap. Like this is just a snippet of it. It went on for quite a while. And I think there's like, well, they got Nmap for beginners. I think there was an Nmap for dummies at one point. And, and this is the threat actor actually searching this on the victim's computer. Um, so right away, this tells me that this is obviously not um, an advanced individual. <laughs> it is probably more likely our ransomware as a service group um, and that we're going to be dealing with a more novice individual in this case. So we started preparing accordingly. But this is why I wanted to share it because it's just never happened. It's is a very interesting um, finding. So we did reach out to the threat actor in this instance. Um, we tend to do that in most cases. We recommend that we do it. We never ever recommend that our clients do it. And the reason for that is because our client is uh, obviously emotionally charged. Um, and also this is probably the the first or like hopefully the first incident that they've ever experienced. So they, are, they don't have any experience talking to these people um, and like, it's no different than if somebody had any other type of ransom like negotiation situation or threat actor negotiation situation. You know, you're not going to have the parents of an individual who's experienced, you know, their child being kidnapped, go in and negotiate with the criminals, uh, you know, to get their child back. Like, it's just not it's not recommended and we don't recommend it in this situation either. Um, we have seen it go very wrong very fast. Um, and in this case, it did. Uh, not this case, sorry. It was a, a case we did after that. It did go very, very, very wrong. Um, and we had to, it's harder for us to go in and try to repair the damage because we obviously don't want them to know that we're professionals. We go in and always pretend that we're part of the company. But in the other case, this 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 IT person was acting uh, not on the, on the wishes of the client and he was an external contractor. So he ended up upsetting them to the point where they closed the communication channel before we were even brought in. So unfortunately, we had to take a very risky chance of contacting them through their site on the dark web. Um, typically, when we do that, it kind of it kind of lets them know that potentially they're not dealing with the victim and they're dealing with someone more advanced. So it was significant risk and ended up turning out OK um, because we were dealing with the actual threat actor group. And, and again, like I said, those tend to be more professional uh, smoother transactions, but it could have gone very, very wrong. So we always say, you know, don't reach out to the threat actor. <laughs> um, bring in somebody that's that can uh, that has the experience, um, has you know done hundreds of thousands of these cases, has dealt with these with this particular group before, has intelligence and information and intel that you don't, um, you know, bring them in and have them reach out to the threat actor. So we tend to do that regardless of whether or not we're going to pay them because. The, we don't want them retaliating on our client. We want to take the pressure off of our client and we want to buy ourselves time in order to do the investigation and figure out what may or may not have been taken. So in this case, following on that threat, that that idea that this is a very novice individual, <laughs> we reached out to them and they um, wanted three point five million dollars for this client. This client was a, uh, you know, a small to medium sized business oil field business um, that had been around for a very, very long time, um, but they were claiming that they were a Tibetan airline <laughs> and, and wanted three and a half million dollars, which was the largest um, 
initial request for ransom that um, we had ever seen. Again, combined between you know myself, our ransomware negotiation people, like our team, their team, and and even and even our national security team. I was like, that's ridiculous. Um, we've never seen anything that high, um, even for the Lockbit group themselves. So again, it it just further fed our notion that we're not dealing with the actual group, um, that we are dealing with. Um, a more novice individual. And they refused to believe that we were not a Tibetan airline. It took them six days before they they decided to, um, you know, believe us. And then they lowered their demand to $120,000. And then they refused to provide us with proof of decryption. They refused to provide us proof of what they had. Um, it was just a very difficult transaction because typically part of this, we ask for obviously proof of what you have, you know, show us what you've got, um, you know, show us that decryption is even possible. And there was a lot of pushback on that. Um, they and they just refused to negotiate. They just were uncooperative um, entirely. In the end, what happened was we identified like one of the main reasons why they didn't want to show us what they had is because what they had was junk. Um, this client only had like a 25 megabit per second upload speed and their critical data was like terabytes in size. And we were able to determine that it was only there was only a spike of about 15 minutes. So we estimated they got about 10 gigs of data and what they got was was literally garbage. We we got, uh, you know, from the from the forensic data, we could see that it was garbage um, and when we did a cost benefit analysis with our client, you know, it was going to cost them only 16,000 Canadian to get back up and running. And that covered our fees, the ransom negotiators fees and, you know, the fees for IT and everyone to get back up and running. And these people wanted like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. It was not going to happen. So uh, the ransom didn't get paid in the end. And and our client basically told told uh, our ransomware negotiation people um, to tell the threat actor to to stick it where the sun don't shine, which is ever no, that's never happened for me either. But I was very proud that he did that. I'm like, yeah, you tell them stick it where the sun don't shine. So they the ransom wasn't paid. Nothing was ever posted online. Um, again, we we monitored this for uh, a long period of time. Like there was nothing for them to post because they didn't take anything. Um, and we did um, work with Edmonton Police Services to provide them with the data for this investigation. So that, in a nutshell, <laughs> is the stuff that we do at GT uh, in the digital forensics and incident response uh, practice. Um, did you have any other questions for me? I encourage you guys to like ask questions if you have. You can also write it on Stephanie. the chat. So mm -hmm. Stephanie, what would you recommend uh, to be uh, the the career pathway, or at least the pathway to get into entry level digital forensics? What are what are some of the basic requirements? Ah, oh, that's a good question. So yes, I get this question a lot. And here's again, the difference between cybersecurity and digital forensics is there really isn't a set path. So a lot of us in this field, if you were to speak to us, um, our backgrounds are all over the place. So one of the, uh, one of, you know, our small little collective here, um, you know, one has a master's in physics, one has a fine arts degree, um, you know, I have myself, you know, I have a master's in forensic science, but my undergrads in biology and anthropology, um, it's all over the place. Um, really, you know, my my associate that I've brought on now, his, you know, he's got a business, uh, you know, a bachelor's in business and financing. Um, you know, the head of the, the principal of the entire practice is, you know, he's got a degree in geology, right? So it, there's really no hard set rule of how this path is going to take you. What really works for people in this field is a certain type of mindset. And what I've been told is that digital forensics is a combination between kind of like an art and a science. So it's a certain type of mindset that seems to do very well in this, as opposed to you saying, you know, step one, you do this, step two, you do that. Um, it doesn't really seem to fall that way. It's more like, it attracts a certain type of mindset, like the investigative mindset, um, as opposed to, um, you know, if you do X, if you take X, Y, Z courses and you get X, Y, Z degrees, then you're guaranteed a job. Um, like I, like I pointed out, it's, there's not 
a lot of us in Canada um, for varying reasons. One is the fact that um, it's not a well known field um, and also it's it tends to be more public sector, like so law enforcement as opposed to private sector. Um, but what you'll find is like if you're to go the law enforcement route, obviously you need to be a police officer, RCMP officer first, and then you transfer into the computer forensics unless you do the civilian route um, and then you get hired on and you do uh, kind of the civilian route. It's there is no the bottom line is there is no hard and fast way to kind of get into it. Um, the best thing to do to, to see the opportunities that are out there is to start networking with other people in the field, right? Because we are a very uh, small, but very fun and very open group. Um, we love people. We love, you know, hanging out and doing fun stuff. So um, the more of us that you start communicating with, the more you'll start to see the opportunities when they do pop up. That makes sense? Thank you. Are there any other questions? I would like to ask one question that yeah. like uh, sometimes we do receive some kind of email or like which has some link, suspicious links or messages. So mm -hmm. we have the urge to click on that link, but we are afraid that we cannot click. We don't know what exactly that is, but like uh, if you want to see and like without uh, messing up with our security, can we do that? Yeah, so one of the things you can do um, is when you get an email, you can check the email headers. You can take a look like a quick look of like who's sending it. Is there like look at the email address? Are there spelling mistakes in it? A lot of the times there are. Are they using zeros or other numbers instead of letters? Because if they're trying to spoof a domain, that's typically what they do. Um, if you know how to open the actual email header itself, you can take a look in there and, and see whether or not there's anything suspicious. If you don't, that's fine. Just take a look at at you know the body of the message as well there tends to be a lot of spelling mistakes um you can even take the person's name and just do a quick google and see if they even work at the company that they say that they're working at um if there's a link if you hover over the link it will tell without clicking on it it should tell you what that link is because even if the link says something legitimate if you hover over it and it's got some really long gobbledygook of some like random ip address and some server that should tell you okay that's not necessarily a legitimate thing to do um other things you can do is you can upload it to places like virus total and they'll do like a quick free check of the email message for you um and you can also like for instance if somebody's spoofing someone that you know and you get a link sent from their email box, call the person and say, did you mean to send this to me? You know, call or text them and and they'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they'll say, oh, no, that's not, you know, don't click on that. Right. So those are just some of the things that you can do um, or even just reach out to, you know, if, if it is on your company email, reach out to your internal IT team and say, look, I'm concerned about this. Can you just check it? So, yeah, you just kind of just have to take that pause and that step back um, from, you know, the impulsive click. Yeah. Because we have that urge. OK, I want to click on that link. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. And that's what a lot of threat actors, you know, rely on is the fact that we're busy and we got a million things going on and we're just like, oh, somebody's sending me else something and they want me to do something. Yeah, but we have to we have to just try to take that step back and and say, am I expecting something? Am I expecting something from this person? You know, and then just kind of do a little bit of our own due diligence before we click on it. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of trackers, as we know, like uh, there are a lot of tracker in our emails or even when in some we uh, click on our links, there are a lot of trackers which uh, like the Google, Google use or any other website. Is there any way like to know that uh, this specific link has some trackers which can actually track our activity or, you know, which can uh, come uh, like back to us or anything in any way? Oh uh, yeah, everything tracks you. That's the answer. Literally everything. Unless you are paying for a service, um, you are the service, right? So anything you use on social media, Google, anything that you use that's free online, you are the service. They're collecting your data and they're selling it. That is 100% what's going on. Is there any way like we can avoid that? We can like not- yeah, There are but you won't like it because then nothing will work for you. <laughs> um, there, you can turn it off. 
Um, but then you lose your ability to use all of your fun features like on your phone, like the the Google Maps and you can't use, you know, the Google Voice and you can't use like a lot. All of your features will stop working essentially is it is possible, but then you're going to basically you might as well just get a plain old flip phone and use that. Um, your smartphone will if it will pretty much be useless. Ah, OK, thanks. No problem. Are there any other questions? No? OK, awesome. Well, thank you guys for letting me speak to you today. I'm, I realize we went a little bit over. Um, I hope that you enjoyed.